Hello and welcome back to the Wise Athletes Podcast with your hosts, Joe Lavelle and Dr. Glenn Winkle. On today's episode, number 106, we are having fun and learning a ton about bike fitting with the owner of Pedal PT, Kevin Schmidt. Kevin is a super fun guy and without a doubt the smartest bike fitter I ever spoke with in my life. He's a genius, I kid you not. So I was not surprised to learn that Kevin's Pedal PT was America's very first physical therapy clinic ever to be certified as a gold-level bike-friendly business from the League of American Cyclists. So listen in to hear Kevin give us a ton of tips about common bike fit issues, plus plenty of ammunition for those of you not in the Portland, Oregon area who are looking for a reliable, trustworthy person to help you make friends with your bike. Pain is not a normal part of riding a bike. Riding your bike should be a joyful experience, even if you are suffering at maximum effort. All right, let's talk to Kevin Schmidt about finding a path to riding without pain. Kevin, welcome to the Wise Athletes Podcast. Great. Thanks for having me. All right, Kevin. Welcome aboard. Great. Appreciate it. Yeah. Hey, I appreciate you taking some time for us here. Bike fitting. <laughs> wow. It is so important and so confusing. I, when I got into cycling, which was a while ago, you know, I go to the bike shop to have my bike adjusted. I go to a physical therapist if I had an injury or a chronic pain. And most of the time when I was, you know, when I wanted to change my bike, I just do it myself, you know based on the strong evidence of my buddy said I ought to do something. And so and I wouldn't keep track of what it was before I changed it. And, you know, so let me just say, even though you could have guessed, it was a long, hard road Damn to man. get to where my bike really fit me. But also that I sort of had the conditioning to ride a bike mm -hmm. in a way that, you know, made it an important difference. So. Wow, it would sure would have been better if I had known a guy like you, you know, a physical therapist yeah, who yeah. knows how to, you know, fit a person on a bike. Yeah. Why don't we start, Kevin, by you telling us your story? How did you become a bike fitter after becoming a physical therapist? Great question. Yeah, great question. So I always like to start this story. Uh, I was raised with cycling. My father was an obsessed cyclist, beyond obsessed cyclist. Um, pretty much every birthday, uh, every anniversary, every anything had to do with bicycling. It was bicycling, stacks of bicycling magazine. Back then it was a performance magazine was back, bike Nash yeah. bar, uh, all Mike these old things. So I was kind of raised with cycling. And, and just as I have unfortunately done to my children, he basically kind of like made it so, so much biking that he kind of ruined it for all of us, you know, because uh, he loved it so much. And, <laughs> and, you know, when it was time to go ride at home, it was basically like, all right, let's go ride a bike. And then he, it would take him 35 minutes to get ready and get everything. And I was just ready to go out the door. And so I think as a kid, I never really got into cycling. I think you never really want to do what your parents do. Yeah. Too. He was so passionate about cycling. And so I, I needed to find something different. I was, I was a basketball player huh? and, and all that. And so to make a long story short, I went through PT school. I'm from Michigan originally and um, graduated PT school in 2002 and promptly moved to Portland, Oregon. Uh, uh -huh. Never worked a day legally as a physical therapist in Michigan. Moved right <laughs> out to Portland, Oregon. So in that time, time span, I basically then took a couple of jobs and slowly advanced myself up the levels of physical therapy. So kind of growing my skills and then eventually uh, was kind of poached by a physician group to help open up five PT clinics in the oh. Portland area and one in Bend, Oregon, which is in central Oregon, all underneath a work comp uh, guys or kind of this group was a work comp group of physicians that needed a physical therapist. And so my friend and I opened up five clinics in Portland uh, and one in Bend. And so ultimately that career, I mean, I was ramping up my income. I was making a ton of money, uh, but I was in the car a good two to three hours uh, a day oh. back and forth to different places, helping to train. Um, and this was kind of you know, this is like the, uh, I'm trying to think this is like 2004, 2005. This is before podcasts and before a lot of these things. Yeah. And so, and so uh, I found that I basically would come home and I would be very aggravated. I was very road ragey uh, and just very angry at life. You're stuck in traffic. You're just yelling at people. And so I came home and I was always <laughs> upset and frustrated. Um, and I was, didn't realize it at the time, but I think I was slowly burning out. I was just yeah. kind of like reaching that point in my career where I just, I didn't know what to do, and I really wasn't treating the patients that I wanted to treat. I wasn't helping the people I wanted to help. I was stuck in the car, uh, and so I was just getting very frustrated. My son was about ready to be born. My very first uh, born was about ready to be born. I didn't want to be an angry dad that came home from the from work just yelling and swearing and just upset with everybody. So in that time, I basically took a massive pay cut, about a forty grand pay cut, and took a job 
two and a half miles from my house so I could never drive a car again. Uh-huh. And so I figured I'm, I'm living in Portland. I might as well like ride a bike and bike commute because this is, you know, Bike City USA. So I should probably do that. And so, yeah. um, of course, my dad was very excited that that all happened. And so I started riding a bike every day. And so, again, it's only two and a half miles to the office. And so I started riding my bike and my life literally changed. I mean, everything in my life improved. My Not only my health, uh, but just my wherewithal, my ability to be present with patients, my ability to help clients. Um, it just felt like everything was really stimulated by me doing this bike thing. Fantastic. Now, the only the tricky part of that was is that I'm only riding two and a half miles one way. Um, and all of a sudden, I started getting neck pain on the bike. Huh. And so I was kind of like, well, that's interesting. But, you know, I don't want to stop riding. So I'm just going to keep riding. And eventually, the neck pain continued to increase and continued to increase. And again, I'm not riding centuries or I'm not wearing Lycra. I'm not doing like what all the road bike guys do. Like, so I never really thought about bike fit. And so the thing that was even more frustrating was the fact that I couldn't figure out why my neck hurt, even though I am all day long in the client, treating clients yeah. with neck pain successfully, <laughs> remedying their neck pain. For some reason, I can't figure out why my neck hurts on this very short bike trip from my house uh, to the clinic. Yeah. Interesting enough, you get no education, zero, absolutely none. No education on bike fit in PT school whatsoever. All right. So this becomes something that for me, I just basically wanted to ride my bike because I enjoyed it. Like I said, it's a habit I continue to this day. I've not driven a car to a work day in now over 16 years. Wow. Um, but at that time, you know, what do you do when you have neck pain? So this kind of goes into your point. What do you do when you have neck pain and you're on the bike? Or, or the joke we always like to say is, you know, you have back pain. Who do you go see? Well, the physical therapist, of course. Uh You got neck pain. Who do you go see? Well, the physical therapist. Uh, You twist your ankle. Who do you go see? The physical therapist. But now I'm getting neck pain, but I'm on a bike. So who do you go see? You go to see the the guy at the bike shop. (laughs) Yeah, this is kind of, you know, and so what did I do? I went to the bike shop because that's what I do. And uh, and so I'm in there and what do they do? They raise my handlebars up. They're like, you got Uh, neck pain. You obviously need to raise your handlebars up. And uh, I said, well, that makes sense to me. Well, they raised my handlebars. My neck pain actually got worse. Oh. And all of a sudden, I'm like, what's going on here? Like, this should be remedying this. I go back to the bike shop again. I think they put yet another stem extender on the top of this stem extender to raise my bars even higher. Uh-huh. As they're installing this gear, this is my light bulb moment. I, as I'm sitting there, I'm kind of rubbing my neck. And I was like, you know, what do you think is going on with my neck? You know, with this bike, I'm not even riding that long. And the guy stopped what he was doing, looked over to me and says, how the hell should I know? I'm not a physical therapist. <laughs> and I said... Man, this whole bike fit thing is all backwards. It's backwards. Like, number one, like I'm here to see you because I'm in pain, not because I want to buy new gear or that I feel like I need new handlebars. And so I started to realize that all of the most of the people or the majority of the bike shop bike fitters know nothing about pain or how to evaluate pain or what causes pain or physiology or my neck for that instance. And so I realized that maybe the best skill set to have is to be able to have someone who can actually evaluate, treat, and remedy pain, but then also understand bike fit concepts and be able to have wrenching skills. Uh I think that's the one thing that we tend to miss is that bike fitters are typically bike shop employees that take a weekend course and all of a sudden they're a certified bike fitter. They have wrenching skills. Uh They're also taught by schools of thought that basically have the underlying premise that equipment solves everything. Mm. So Kevin, if you have neck pain, you obviously need new handlebars or a new something or a new something. They don't quite understand posture. They don't understand. So anyway, to make a long story short, my neck pain continued to worsen. So selfishly, I just wanted to remedy my own problem. And so I basically took some continuing education courses uh, up in Seattle, Washington, up above me. And luckily, there was a PT teaching some very rudimentary bike fit courses. And I was able to figure out why my neck was hurting. So I learned kind of the basic understandings of that. So I was able to remedy my own neck problem. Ultimately, the secret was is that I was actually sold a bike with my dad who knew everything about bikes. I was I bought a bike that was too small for me. And so what ended up happening is that I was actually too compressed on that bike. And so if we can't kind of lift our chest or backwards bend our upper back, you can't get your head over your shoulders. Uh, so as they continue to raise my handlebars, it just made me more and more cramped, more and more cramped uh, again. So I was able to remedy my own situation. Thought that was the end of that. I was like, that was fun. Everybody at the clinic then started asking me about this whole bike fitting thing. They're like, well, what did you do? Will you look at my bike? And I was like, I guess, sure, why not? <laughs> One thing led to another, and by, by the end of about two to three months of me talking about bike fit, all I was doing in that clinic was looking at people 
and on their bikes and come to find out 95% of these people that also went to the bike shop folks never really got remedying of their symptoms whatsoever. So they started to kind of understand. So that was kind of my journey about slowly picking up that. Uh, I was the first one in town that started to, we can actually build bike fit through health insurance and a variety of ways to do that. So kind of moved forward with that. To make a long story short, my father suddenly passed away oh. uh, in 2010 uh, of cancer. It was kind of unexpected. He died. Uh, and then about three months later, my grandmother, my father's mom, died as well. Wow. Uh, those two things obviously had a massive impact, not only on me, just as you can imagine, but all of a sudden my risk tolerance kind of went out the door. And so that was with the time when I realized it was time for me to open my own practice. And you know what? I'm going to open up this bike themed physical therapy practice. And I don't really care. My dad is gone. He's not gonna be able to see this. But as an homage to him, uh. I'm going to kind of take on this whole uh, kind of bike fitting and physical therapy office. What does that even look like? I don't really know, but I'm going to try to create this this thing. Awesome. And and so that in 2012 is when we opened uh, officially. So we're almost at um, you know 11 years coming up this August as well. And it's been we opened up. And when we first opened, uh, the crazy thing was is that we were kind of the laughing stock of the medical community. Yeah. Interesting enough, because people said like a bike PT clinic. What, what are you going to do? Just have people ride on exercise bikes? And uh, what are you gonna do? So they didn't quite understand that, you know, kind of to be a good bike fitter, you have to be kind of pretty much part PT, part wrench monkey. You have to have this kind of blending of skills to not only understand the body and posture, but you also have to be able to understand pieces, parts and be able to use wrenches and things like that. And so that's kind of the, that's kind of my origin story was basically I turned, I was frustrated car commuter turned frustrated, you know, turned bike commuter turned frustrated bike commuter because of pain wow. and then realizing that most of the people that are performing bike fit have no idea on how to evaluate pain, let alone treat that remedy that and understand how our body then can really influence our positioning on the bike. Probably so much more so than just the pieces parts that we use. So yeah. 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 Wow. Well, good story. Um, yeah. Sorry to hear about the tragedies there, but yeah. looks like you, um, turned those tragedies into motivation to do something great. So sure. good for you. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm looking at the clock here and I can, and I've got like 10 big questions that I wanted to get yeah. through here. And I see that we're a quarter of the way through our time and we've touched on question number one. So th unless we're going to do a three hour podcast, I'm going to have to kind of skip ahead here. Yeah, so no let's, problem. let's talk about the different kinds of goals that, a person might come to you for, you know, I mean, the obvious thing is, A, my neck hurts when I ride my bike. So, you know, I've got pain and I, and I want to resolve that pain or gosh, you know, I've got a uh, dual sided power meters and I've noticed that I got a lot more power on one side than the other, or maybe they would say I've got a lot less power on one yeah. side and, uh, and that can't be good. Uh, so, you know, can you help me with that? Or gosh, I've got these, like, I've got all of these spacers on my headset and, you know, I'm sitting really upright and I see all my buddies are down low and very aerodynamic and gosh, maybe I should get more aerodynamic on my bicycle uh, so that my, the same amount of power, I go faster, those kinds of things. So what, what would you say are the reasons people come to see you for a bike fit? Yeah, I think, I think for us, because we're, because we're, you know, a PT office first and foremost, yeah. I would say probably 95% of the people that we see, if not 99% of people is because of pain. Yeah. They have, they have pain that they cannot solve. And, and what I want to follow that with is that I think we always talk about pain and they always say, about, well, cycling is about suffering, right? It's about pain. And that's a funny thing to say, but I think people a lot of times just assume that's just kind of yeah. part of riding a bike. What's the real answer, Kevin? So the real answer is, is that it comes down to very simple differentiation. If you're suffering with pain, that's okay. That means if you're climbing a hill and your lungs are burning and your eyes are about ready to pop out of your head, yeah. you can stop. You can, you can stop and take a rest and you can make that pain go away. You're suffering yeah. with the pain. You're deciding to choose to push through that. Okay. If you're suffering from pain, that's a different story. Okay. That means you can't make it go away. And when people suffer from pain, that means I'm trying my best to make this knee pain go away. But every time I take a pedal stroke, it's like an ice pick in my knee. So that's what we're trying to help people with is the folks suffering from pain, not with pain. Because myself, as, a, as an ultra endurance cyclist, I'm all about suffering with pain. I am not about suffering yeah. from pain. And I think we just have um, 
and maybe it's just me, but you know, I think that there's a, a lack of precision in the word pain and, and that, you know, we talk about how your muscles hurt when you're going at your maximum. And you also talk about sometimes it's like, you know, my neck hurts when I'm in a time trial bike and I'm, you know, having to hold my head up in a way that I, I'm not used to. And after a while, it's screaming at me. Well, these are different kinds of things. And, you know, when your muscles are hurting because you're using them really hard, okay, it hurts. That's pain, but that's not the kind of pain that's normal. But the you have a saddle issue or your knee hurts every time you press on the pedal. That's not right. And no, the answer is I'm pretty sure no, that's not normal. Cycling is not about that kind of pain. So uh, you can help people with that, I guess. And I suppose maybe that's why they come to you, but you try to help them with all of the other priorities as well. Get, you know, what do they want to do? Are they, are they going to race the bike or are they just riding 10 minutes to work or, you know, are they, you know, those kinds of things. And so maybe you've got a top priority of getting them to stop hurting in the way that they shouldn't have to, but then also give them the performance. Yeah. Every person has their own individual goals. And like I said, we, I think that the cool part about this office is that we see all kinds of people. We see bike commuters. We see people on recumbents. We see people on hand bikes. We see people with below knee amputees that want to get onto bikes. We have uh-huh. people with knee contractures. We have people with all kinds of unique pathologies that allow that. And then we also do see our, our elite level road cyclists that just want to go faster. And a lot of times with those guys, sometimes it's not about comfort. It's about speed. And sometimes there is sacrifices that can be had to make those adjustments. But a lot of times, some of those folks, it really doesn't matter if it hurts to them. Speed and the output and the ability to crank out (laughs) massive wattage is the only thing that matters to them. And we can help them with that too. So it kind of just depends on what they're looking for. But most people that we tend to see, they just want to be able to ride, increase their length of rides, longer rides, maybe do their first century, maybe do a little bit of racing or cycle cross. Um, But yeah, it gets just kind of, kind of, it goes through that whole spectrum of, you know, and we're actually seeing a lot of e-bike bike fits, believe it or not, these days too. So mountain bike bike fits, all these kind of different arenas and different, you know, growth sectors in the cycling yeah. community. We always say, if you can pedal it, we'll, we'll do a bike fit on it. And I've probably seen <laughs> 95% of what is even pedalable uh, out there on the bike. So. All right. All right. Well, that's great, Kevin. Uh, so let's talk about the bike fit itself. Yeah. And I'm guessing that there's a process, right? You know, there's some key things that you got to get right. And maybe there's a series of steps that have to be done in a certain kind of order or. Yeah. And I'm guessing also that it would be okay for us to talk about the bike and how you might adjust the bike to the person. But then I want, so let's talk about that first. And then let's talk about the person, right? What complications the person's body, maybe their brain bring to this puzzle that you're trying to solve. And so, you know, I've heard it said that the bike is adjustable, right? And it can be adjusted in, a, in, a, in many different ways, but a body is adaptable. So that takes time. So there are things that you can tell about a person, especially being a PT, whether it's an imbalance this or a, a asymmetry that. And some of these things can be a lack of flexibility or a lack of strength or in a balance and strength can be adjusted over time. A person can work on it and they can get stronger. I did it myself. Every morning when I first started riding a bike, I would roll out of bed and I would do my supermans and I would do my planks and I, you know, and I was trying to work on my core so that I could ride the bike better. And that worked for me and I bet it could work for everybody. So let's talk about the bike and then let's talk about the the complications of a person. And so I think I've heard you say that the bike fit is 90% body and 10% bike. Was that you? Well, I probably, probably at this phase, I'd probably work on like 80, 20. Kind okay. of thing. It just, probably just depends. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. And it's probably yeah, different every single time, but sometimes yeah. it is the bike or it is the equipment. Yeah, absolutely. It is. Tell to us about what equipment type things, you know, come up. Yeah. I mean, to, to kind of, to kind of, kind of trace that all the way back as far as equipment goes, The things that can be moved on the bike are the things that we have to kind of control first is number one, we have to control the feet. We have to start at the foot. Uh, Everything in bike fit builds off of one another. So once we've got that, if your cleats are off and you're not in a good position on your foot, you can do a lot of great things to your bike fit. But if you are locked into those pedals, you are stuck in a pattern that might possibly 
cause pain uh, or an yeah. issue. So until the feet are taken care of, we always have to start from the feet. Everything kind of checks boxes. You have to start from the foot because remember, foot position will affect saddle height. If we move a cleat back to move the foot forward on the pedal, that effectively raises one's saddle. Okay. If we slide that foot toward the toes, that would effectively lower someone's saddle. Uh-huh. If we widen or narrow someone's width of stance, that will also affect height. So we're basing this a lot on, on kind of basic measurements or numbers. Everything builds off of the foot. So even when we see folks without clipless pedals, we have to educate them on the correct position where the foot should be on the pedal. Uh-huh. And therefore, we base our fit based on that because everything stacks on top of that. From there, we go from from essentially the foot position, then we go to saddle position. And that's basically fore and aft, up and down, and tilt, nose up, nose down. And probably the where people tend to screw up the most or miss the most, which is probably the biggest bang for your buck, has to do more with saddle tilt, believe it or not. Huh. Uh, if people cannot lock the pelvis down while they're pedaling, you are going to start causing a myriad of issues because you're not getting a consistent pedal stroke each time. If you're sliding forward, the huh. knees can slide forward. If you're nose down, you're going to put a lot more pressure on your hands. Therefore, you're going to typically push yourself back up to stay on that saddle, therefore locking out elbows. That causes us to round our upper back. That increases our reach. That increases chances of hand numbness uh, uh. and extremity numbness, neck pain, things of that. Nature. So if we're not level on that saddle and we are sliding and moving around, we're not consistent. Does that happen because um, the you know it wasn't tightened enough and it'll slip, or is it because people's saddle was set too high and it hurt them, and so yeah. they lowered the nose a little bit so it wouldn't hurt as much? That's usually it. Yeah, a lot uh-huh. of times people people don't people don't a lot of times, and I didn't either when I first learned this. They don't realize that tilt is even an option. Uh-huh. That I didn't even know you could move the saddle like that. <laughs> oh, you can move it nose up down. Yeah. And that might be sometimes the biggest bang for the buck is getting that dialed in right. The simplest thing, but then you've got you long-term got consequences. You got it. And like I said, and, and like I said, people always assume, especially with saddle pain, for instance, which is a, a whole Pandora's box, so we could probably have a whole show on saddle pain, yeah. is even with the perfect saddle, the one that anatomically is made for you, it's the holy grail of all saddles. They could give you that saddle and it could still cause saddle pain if it's not positioned correctly. Uh, uh. That would be the correct saddle height. If you're too high on the saddle and you're reaching at the bottom of every pedal stroke and it's causing you to shift and we've all been behind people riding and their hips are rocking back and forth, you're just sawing on the top of that saddle. Oh, yeah. So it doesn't matter. It's, it's the right saddle. So we have a lot of places people are, keep saddle shopping all the time, keep thinking they're going to find this magical saddle when they don't change the saddle height at all. Oh, they just leave it high. They put a new saddle. Oh, is this one better? No, I'm still getting saddle pain. All right. Same thing. Again, if you're too high or your tilt is not correct or your fore aft is not correct, you're still going to get saddle pain. Yeah. So I think that sometimes people start, again, there, it comes into the equipment solves everything. I have saddle pain, so therefore I obviously need a new saddle. It's got to be the saddle's fault. And therefore they end up just this shopping kind of thing. And eventually we get someone in. I mean, I had one person come in with this beautiful like $400 saddle and they said, you know what? I hate this thing. It's horrible. <laughs> it feels terrible. Do you want this? And I was kind of like, maybe I do actually. <laughs> Well, I did the right thing, and we positioned them correctly. And by the time he left, he's like, "This is the most comfortable saddle I've ever sat on." That's I amazing. Should have probably taken the saddle from him and got it for like fifty bucks. Or something. <laughs> that is funny. So, what what do you think is like a generally uh, good idea? Is there is there like any generalities about you know saddles that tend to work for the most people, or is it really yeah. personal? I mean, I think it is really personal. I think I think the thing to think about too is that if we have a I guess the generalized idea is the more upright you are on the bike, yeah. the, the wider the saddle you okay. can tolerate. And the reason I say is that the more vertical our trunk is, our sitting bones are wider when we're sitting vertically, like all of us sitting here on a chair. We're yeah. sitting upright. We're sitting directly on those sitting bones. If we look at that anatomy as we start to roll our pelvis forward and we start to roll, rock that forward, the pelvis then starts to taper inwards as we get towards the pubic symphysis is what we call the, the pubic rami. That narrows down. So if we have someone with a very low handlebar and a high saddle position, and they can tolerate that, like you look at the pros and these guys with just massive drop, they can be a much skinnier saddle because you're going to be flexed forward more over that. And you're going to be typically on the narrower part of your pelvis. That's the generalized rule. Now, the same thing can go, though, is that sometimes just anatomy just doesn't line up. And so what I always recommend to people, if you're getting saddle pain and the saddle height is correct, and you're getting true perineal pain underneath on the soft tissues 
or uh, compression issues, impotence issues, urinary issues, when in doubt, go wider. Okay. Because what that's suggesting then is that the saddle is too narrow and therefore your pelvis is sitting on the outside of the saddle, not kind of on that wider part of the saddle. So you're not on the bones, you're on the, the flesh. You got it. And that's where saddle tilt becomes such a big player because if we are nose down, most folks then will be forward on that saddle. So their sitting area or their pubic rami is now more closer to the nose of the saddle versus being able to keep their their kind of pubic ram in those areas more to the wider part of the saddle on the back. I gotcha. And what about like, I mean, some saddles, for example, the saddle that I am still using that, um, you know, uh, I just have replaced with the exact same saddle is the only one that has ever worked for me is rather flat. And so, you know, there's a lot of positions on it that are good for me. Yeah. And the saddles that I always tried to make work were ones that had more curve to them. And so mm-hmm. you'd kind of sit down in the valley of the thing. And so mm-hmm. the idea was that, you know, I'd, I'd be able to get a little, you know, more, uh, you know, push. Yeah. But yeah. I could never get them to work. So uh, it, mm-hmm. or it's like uh, the flatter ones have a bigger sweet spot, maybe. And so they're easier to get the fit. Uh, what, any thoughts on that? I have to say, really tricky. I'm not a fan of the curved saddles either. I'm uh, just okay. not. Uh, they just don't work with my anatomy. I play with tilt. I just, I think some people just have a personal preference uh, about some of these more curvy saddles versus flat. I always say when we generally advise people on saddles, we always say go for flat. Just get a flat surface and doesn't, you know, it domes around the edge, but just try to stay flat. The more curvature, it's just adds more variables or more angles that we have to now play with, yeah. uh, with tilt yeah. as well. And I just personally, I just never quite found them comfortable either. So, but for some people that is kind of their thing. But like I said, when we're assessing tilt with those, especially the main thing you have to be aware of is that we don't measure tilt based on a bubble level. We base it on the ability for you to feel that you're not going to slide off. Right, you can't right. just use a bubble level on a saddle or a laser level because it's fabric, it has to give, it has to compress, it has to create this hammock effect to hold us up there. And so purely looking at what something looks like level or measuring it as level, oftentimes is nose down or can dump people forward uh, on that saddle too. So we always have to kind of do what we call a sit up test, which is we are on the bike, we then take our hands off the handlebars, we come up to see that, you know, no handed, and then letting the body go limp, moving forward, being able to slide back and forward and not feeling like you're going to slide off that is kind of how we determine that level. Fantastic. So I think that's kind of a tricky thing. And like I said, with those curved saddles, sometimes you can play with tilts. Sometimes they work for people. Sometimes they just don't. And that would be an instance of maybe it's more the saddle versus the body uh, yeah. as well. Too. So. Yeah. I've got a couple of curved saddles. I'll sell you cheap. Uh, okay. I wanted to ask you about shoes. Take <laughs> yeah, sure. The best shoes I ever had were Bonts. They were, you know, big toe box, wide, super yeah. comfortable shoes, very stiff because it was sort of like the bathtub, you know, it wasn't just like a, a sole on the bottom. But I've heard a lot of people complaining about how their feet hurt when they're, yeah. when they're riding it. I mean, is that because the shoes are too small? Uh, it's a possibility. It's a possibility. Depends on where they feel it and what they're feeling. So a lot of times what we have to do is really dissect what the pain is. So if you're getting pain right underneath the metatarsals of the foot or kind of the bony part of the foot, that is cleat related. Your uh-huh. cleat is probably too far underneath the ball of the foot. You actually need to move that cleat back so you're uh-huh. off those bony pieces. Number two, people will talk about tingling and numbness. That's another classic example of typically cleat position is off, but it could also be that the shoe is too narrow on the foot. The nerves of the feet live in between the metatarsal bones, which are kind of in between the feet. So as we ride, our feet swell, and as they swell, that then creates compression or compression through the width of the foot. And that's typically what causes our feet to go asleep as well. So it could be a possibility that now – Sometimes people talk about hot foot or, you know, hot foot or kind of these like rub foot. That's often a sign that maybe you've got too much room in the shoe and now you're sliding around. So you're creating this friction kind of thing. Uh. And in those cases, we need to. And this is where a lot of the bike fitters would be like, we need wedges in the shoes. We need all this stuff. Oftentimes you don't need wedges. You just need more space filled inside the shoe. Like a thicker sock. A thicker sock could work. A uh, excuse me, a simple, uh, you know, or not a custom orthotic, but just an over-the-counter orthotic. Not just to fill in the volume. You just need something to fill the volume uh-uh. of that shoe to take up more space. And most people that have those issues that love 
all this stuff in their shoe. It's just basically taking up more space. So the foot is a little bit more secure. So we're not sliding around. Gotcha. What, what about the age factor too? Cause I, again, we're talking about shoes and talking about bonds and I ride bonds. I've never had a problem with my feet and I've been riding bonds for 20 years and now my feet are going numb and <laughs> nothing's changed, but me, I got older. <laughs> yeah. So do you find that's a problem too with age? It could possibly too. I mean, I think as we age, or I, as I like to say, as we get more experienced in life, <laughs> um, our tissues just become less durable to stress and to changes. I think, you know, I would ride hundreds of miles and have never have a saddle issue. And now recently, as I'm getting into my mid to later 40s, like all of a sudden I'm starting to develop more saddle issues more than ever. Just tissues lose water. We just lose durability. We just can't kind of recover quite as faster and so hard to say with that sometimes equipment just breaks down too so sometimes shoes sometimes cleats if they're not you know even the cleats if you're not getting a good uh kind of lockdown or kind of connection between that cleat and the pedal that can sometimes kind of cause foot pain too so hard to say real real tricky it's always it's very interesting to evaluate because sometimes this is a body issue that needs looking at Sometimes it's only on the bike, you know, so we, the, the, the loaded question a lot of times was that is, are you also getting foot pain when you're not on the bike? And some people are like, oh yeah, I foot pain every day. It was like, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't question. Make, yeah. Yeah. you can't make this amazing adjustment. Well, I thought you were just adjust my cleats to make my foot pain go away. I was like, well, you do have pain every day, right? In your feet. Like, well, yeah. And I was like, well, okay, well, let's, let's, let's set realistic expectations for this bike fit now. Like, you know, maybe we should look at your foot first before you're even in a cycling shoe. Y'all. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, so the last thing I wanted to ask you about, uh, I mean, there's, there's a million things to talk about with yeah. the equipment, but I will say that the one thing that I, I did wrong, and I want, I'll bet you that people are doing this, is that I always went cheap on the cycling shorts until, you know, eventually I started racing and I, and I was on a team and, the, and they had good kit with good padding in the bibs. And it was like, wow, there's a big difference between cheapo and really good. Yeah. Yeah. And usually it ends up being a lot of times in longevity too. Like some of that cheap stuff. You don't get a whole lot of rides in there before that chamois starts breaking down and starts really not doing a whole lot anymore. But yeah, it's it's true. And that's a that's a whole nother Pandora's box of saddle meets chamois meets equipment. But yes, a good quality chamois pad is a very, very valuable <laughs> thing to have yeah, um, right. on rides for sure. Yep. Yeah. Oh, and, and for the, the one person listening who wears their underwear under their bibs, stop doing that. <laughs> I distinctly remember that conversation with my dad when I was about 13. And I was like, wait a minute, you don't wear underwear? I no. I was like, so what? Gross. Weird. <laughs> seams. It's all about seams, man. Like, oh, right. okay. Yeah, I get that now. That makes sense. And I even see clients here at the office too. And so I was like, I was like are you wearing underwear under it? Yeah. You know, you really don't need that. Really? I want to try that. You might like that. (laughs) It'll make a difference. Right. Okay. So let's move on and talk about the body um, because this is probably the the biggest reason that there's an advantage of working with a PT. The body, you know, the bicycle is an amazingly perfectly symmetrical machine designed so well. A body and a machine working well together, it's like meditation. It's, It's wonderful. But bodies are not always symmetrical. Maybe they're almost never symmetrical. Um, what, what are some of the things that uh, people that you encounter that uh, people have got to deal with? You mean as far as symptoms they have or uh, things? Are yeah, just yeah. I mean, people could have yeah. limb length differences or muscle imbalances, or maybe they've got compensations from injuries or those kinds of yeah. things. And people come to you and they say, what? Well, I mean, yeah, a lot of times we always kind of go through a good health history with them first because some people have, uh, you know, knee replacements and hip replacements and plates and screws in their body and previous fractures um, and a lot of other trauma. We always kind of, you know, like I said, we're not we're not perfect. Our right side is not equal to our left side as well. And so when we I think that's the beauty of being a PT is that we spend a good first 20 minutes just moving the body around before we even have the bike set up on the trainer and even see someone on a on a on a, on a bike because We have to understand the capabilities of the body first and how they do things. How do you squat? How do you stand? What's your posture look like? What's your range of motion look like? Because that kind of gives us a good idea on what we would expect or a hypothesis of what might be causing the symptoms on the bike as well. So if we can evaluate the body. So to give you some examples, like a lot of times we run into folks with hip hip issues. And what I mean by that is that their hips 
generally don't bend much higher than about 90 degrees. Hmm. Okay? So if we have someone that has a problem with 90, you know, at 90 degrees, they get really stiff. You know, we sit all the time. So we're at this 90 degrees. So if someone gets on a bike, the most difficult thing for them will be at the top of the pedal stroke because that knee gets over the top. The hip has to bend the most. So a lot of times we'll get compensation or we'll see people rocking on the saddle, not from a saddle height issue, but because that hip is tight, when we try to get over the top of that pedal stroke, we're going to hike off that hip. Uh-huh. So as soon as we have a range of motion issue, then now we have to play bike fit and we have to kind of play around with that, i.e., do we need to possibly raise the saddle higher? That will make it so we don't have to get quite as high at the top of the pedal stroke. Do we possibly want to raise the front end? That would be another way to take pressure off the hip at the top of the pedal stroke. Uh-huh. Do we want to think about shorter cranks? Uh-huh. The pedal stroke, that's another idea. So this is where we kind of start to say like, all right, the hip doesn't bend past 90. Can we give that client stretches or ways to improve that mobility? Well, why don't we go there first? Let's just try that. And then we kind of start making some adaptations because once we start to sacrifice one thing, it starts to influence the other. If we have some too high because they can't get that hip over the top of the pedal stroke, now if we raise them higher, now we've actually increased their reach. Or maybe we put more pressure to the saddle or et cetera, et cetera. So it all kind of ties together based on these perhaps range of motion discrepancies, leg length discrepancies, um, previous trauma. We have folks that have had cancer uh, in their leg where they have a rod put in their leg and have broken their hip with a hip replacement and now have nerve damage and can't even externally rotate their foot. I mean, we see very, very complex things here. And so we have to be very clever on making the adjustment, but really knowing all ways you can attack that kind of aspect of either making the bike bigger, smaller, et cetera, et cetera, to get them out of that pain zone, if you will. Yeah, yeah I've heard it described as, uh, you know, if you've got a fully functional body, then you've got lots of degrees of freedom in how you're going to pos- get positioned on the bike to accomplish goals, yeah. uh, aerodynamics, that sort of thing. But if you've got limitations in your functionality, then you've got a narrower window to, to yeah. squeeze into. Yeah. That makes sense. So what do you do for people? I mean, do you give them exercises to do? Do you say, oh, you should go to a yoga class uh, or, you know, go to the gym and start uh, doing some leg extensions? I mean, what do you do? Yeah. Yeah. It all kind of depends on the person, the symptoms they're having uh, per se. I mean, like I said, some of this stuff is easily remedied by just giving someone some very simple stretches. Um, Oftentimes we're seeing people, the benefit that I have at my office that we generally see people concordantly with PT and bike fit. So it's not just kind of like, come in for a bike fit, see you later. It's kind of like, hey, I understand you're getting some lower back pain. Let me give you some things and some strategies and some ways to work on flexibility or strength to help support the spine. Let's also then get you on the bike and let's see how that shakes out. All right, that's not working. Okay, let's modify this. So we're, we're kind of working because oftentimes it's not just one or the other. It's kind of sometimes a combination of the other. And it's that Venn diagram of kind of a little bit of body, a little bit of this. And then all these variables of the bike, including skills on the bike, like how are we shifting? Are we getting out of the saddle? Like there's so many variables that can cause pain with bike because the thing we forget to realize is that the body, the human body was never designed to ride a bike. We were never created to be flex forward on this vehicle pedaling. We just weren't made for that. So we have to kind of get the body to understand that and adapt to that and understand what good posture is etc. on the bike. Oh, sure. I actually, because it was so traumatic, I can still remember the first time I rode a drop bar bike. After years of riding a mountain bike, and I'm on this drop bar bike, and I thought, I'm going to die. This thing, who (laughs) who invented this stupid handlebar? I don't want this handlebar. Mm -hmm. Well, you're right. Yeah. It wasn't very long before I, I got my body to adapt to it. And and within a couple of years, I was racing on the velodrome and yeah. in, a, in a very aggressive position. So the body adapts if you are patient with it and don't injure it. The body will adapt for sure. Yeah. And, and like I said, none of us really get much education on what good posture on the bike even looks like. So we see the guys on TV. Of course. But if we all try to get our bike to look like Peter Sagan's bike, we would we would all have back pain and neck pain because we have to realize those pros – those are number one genetic freaks anyway. Yeah. Like those yeah. guys are just amazing. I mean, if you see some of the flexibility and the things these guys can do, it's just unbelievable. But I think what happens is that, yes, us as as the 
outsiders of the public were like, well, especially in triathletes, this is a real common we see in triathletes is they're like, well, my favorite triathlete has their handlebars literally six inches lower than their saddle, then I should be able to do that too. When they don't have the flexibility, let alone the conditioning or the training or the adaptations that's happened to the body to allow that person to be in such an aggressive position too. Right. And then the, the next variable is that that pro level guy is not in that position for as long as you are because he's way faster. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's also 21 years old, too. You know, so I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. That, that's that's that age thing again. Yeah. OK. All right. Well, let's move on. Um, get my eye on the clock here. Uh, sure. So let's talk about, you know, some advice for the cyclist who is listening in here. You know, we're going to tell them how to find you. And I don't know whether you guys do like video or, or tele uh, fitting and that sort of thing. But for people who don't live anywhere near Portland, Oregon, and they got to find, they want to find a good fitter, what should they look for? Maybe they should look for a PT bike fitter, but uh, you know, what would you say, you know, this is what you should look for and this is what you should be careful of and you know, whatever you're comfortable saying. Great question. I mean, I think, I think of course I'm biased, um, you know, I, I do a lot of teaching. I teach a lot of PTs on how to do bike fit. So I have something called the Pedal PT Online Academy where I actually teach uh, PTs all over the country and actually internationally on how to do bike fit as a clinician. Oh, uh, like I said, us as PTs, we have the background. We have all this knowledge. They just don't quite understand those just very basic concepts of bike fit. So I go from that. Now, when it comes to finding a good bike fitter, I think just like anything else, talk to your friends, talk to uh, colleagues. References. I'm not saying that all bike shop bike fitters are bad i don't want you guys to ever get that idea the people that you'll want to be concerned with are the people that are very quick to sell you gear and the people that all they talk about is gear and the people on their instagram account all they say is look at my selection of saddles look at all my new handlebars look at all my new equipment it's not about the body they're just about selling gear because bike fit this is the secret that that is when industry heard me say this so they got very upset with me is that Industry-based bike fit was based on upselling. Yeah. The reason bike shops have bike fit generally is it's a money maker and a way to sell more equipment. Yeah. Sadly, that's how it is. You have an unsuspecting cyclist that knows nothing about bike fit or what should be right on the bike. They come into the shop and they're going to kind of sell them. So be very careful of someone very quick to start installing new gear on your bike before they even talk to you. Yeah. I've had folks come in before and they said their very their bike fit. They went at the bike shop. They went in there and before the guy had even gotten on the bike, he had already unwrapped the bars and was putting a $300 carbon bar on his bike. Uh-huh. And he said, well, are you getting hand pain or wrist pain? He said, no. The guy just said I needed a new handlebar. That's what he said. So now you're spending your $300 for a bike fit. Now you've got this on top of this. And so, again, be very careful. Bike shops that have a lot of inventory of bike equipment, i.e. handlebars, things are much more actively trying to sell you that because they do not want ten thousand dollars of handlebars sitting in their back room they want to unload that stuff so that'd be my first advice is be aware of be weary of everyone all they do is talk about gear and the new shoes they just got in and all this stuff because they're going to be very into more about the gear than actually really understanding you and your unique complex issue that you might be handling all right good that's good Uh, of course a pt is going to give you great information about your body what might be causing that just because you're a PT also does not mean you're a good bike fitter as well. I will yeah. tell you a story. I, I, of course, a lot of times I'm the last one in the chain of everyone. They, when no one can fix them, they eventually come to see us. Is What happens is I saw someone maybe a month ago and they came in and they're like, I'm just curious what you have to say. I've seen three PTs and they've given me bike fit and no one's been able to help me. And once I get their bike set up, talk to them, I then start with the foot and start adjusting their cleats. And they said, you know, what's crazy you know, I've seen three PTs, but not even one of them has even looked at my cleats. Not even one of them has looked at my shoes. And that was what you said was number one. That's the first step. I was, like, I, was like, I was like, oh, my goodness. So I think there are PTs out there. This is I'm going to throw PTs under the bus a little bit, too. There are PTs that are literally operating on the ego of like, well, I'm a PT. I know everything. I'm so much better than the bike fitters. Yet they miss a lot of very simple things because of perhaps ego or other things are not being, uh, you know, in tune with that person but if you're not looking at cleats trust me i don't care what you're doing if you're if you're not a bike fitter and you're afraid to look at someone's cleats you're not a bike fitter don't don't just don't do it just mm. just call, just give them my number and they can come over to me and we'll look at them yeah okay <laughs> all right good tip good tip my, my next question is for the people 
and I, I, I know some of these people. I am some of these people, I uh, have to admit, the, the do-it-yourselfer types. You sure. know, it's like, oh, I had a bike fit once. That was useless. I'll just do it myself. I got YouTube. Sure. I got a torque wrench. Yeah. I'm good. Well, all right. Uh, and some people are good. I mean, maybe they had enough bike fits and, and they've worked through whatever their body issues were and, and they can do that. But I guess I'm asking, I'm going to ask you for two things. One is, if a person has pain you know, the kind of pain that they really shouldn't have, but they just keep riding through it and they deal with it after the ride. And it, by the time it, they're not going to ride again until the pain has gone away. Are they going to work that out or are they making problems for themselves, more permanent type problems? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think that's a really hard one to answer. I think some people are successful, but I think it comes down to realistic expectations versus unrealistic expectations is that I think when you're a do-it-yourselfer, you're expecting an immediate change. Uh -huh. They're expecting, well, I have knee pain, so I'm going to do a couple things with my saddle, and that maybe that's the wrong thing to do, and they give it one ride. And after that first one, oh, <laughs> my knee still hurts. I better do something different. Yeah. So a lot of times they don't understand this concept of adaptation. So if you got pain and we make adjustments, it might not be – perfect right away, but now your body is in a safe position that we can start to slowly adapt and improve. And I think that's what the DIYers are, is expecting and just, well, as long as I have the right positioning, and as long as I move this thing right, everything will just disappear and everything will be perfect. Yeah, yeah. So if they're using the pain as the signal of, okay, I made the right change, Correct. that's a lag, that's a much lagging indicator. Sometimes it takes time just depending on, if you've had knee pain on the bike for two years, and you make a simple adjustment to your saddle, don't expect the next ride to be 100%. Yeah. Your knee free. is still irritated from two years yeah. of abuse. You got it. There's still a problem there that has to be addressed. And maybe you've now caused an injury that is more now an orthopedic injury to be addressed more so than a bike fit issue. So I think that can happen now. I think some people have a really good, I mean, you mentioned YouTube. Uh, I'll plug my YouTube channel if anybody's out there listening as well. Um, but there's a lot of actually fairly good useful information that does follow general rationale. The tricky part is how do you sift through so much uh, of that information? It's really, really hard. Um, a lot of times I try to base everything on location of pain and get very specific on where you feel the pain. Because hmm. if we just talk about, let's say, knee pain, for example, if you have front of knee pain, the adjustment for that is totally different than someone that has back of knee pain. Uh -huh. Or outside of knee pain is a totally generally a different concept of adjustment than inside of knee pain. Okay. So we have to really get very specific. Of where do you feel it? If your hand goes numb, which fingers go numb? Because you can get compression of nerves from a variety of sources. So we have to really almost really granularize on what is the symptom you're feeling and then almost kind of reverse engineer on what could cause that and then kind of go from there too. I so I think if people could kind of get it more into that mindset, they would probably be more successful in the DIY world. But I think a lot of times what people also need from me and from folks like me that are doing bike fit is they need affirmation that you are in a good position now. You are in a safe position now. Don't adjust this for two weeks. I got to give it some time now. Yeah, you need to let your body adapt and get used to this. You know? And I suppose maybe sometimes it's, a, it's an off the bike thing. It's like do this therapy yeah. And that'll yeah. strengthen this or loosen that or um, give that a chance to heal up and then, but your bike fit is fine. Right, right. And I, I, because everybody, when we deal with bike fit, it's not like millimeters do matter, but we have kind of a zone of safety. You know, if your knee angles are around this angle, if your positioning is, you're in a safe zone. You're in this nice green zone. You get more extreme. So we get into more aggressive positioning, more race position. Now we're kind of getting into yellow yellow zone, kind of caution a little bit. We're getting right to those extremes. And then there's definitely like red, you know, your saddle is way too high. Your saddle is way too low, yeah. these extremes. And it, a lot of times it's based on time. Bike fit is always based on time. So the idea being is that we see folks that come in and, you know, at mile 65 and 4,000 feet of climbing, my knee starts getting a little sore versus the person is like, I, I commute and I ride two and a half miles and my neck hurts. Yeah. That's a much more significant onset or it happens so quickly that there must be something drastic that is yeah. wrong versus the person at 65 miles with knee pain. That might be a few millimeters or a slight rotation to the cleat is all they need to get them in that kind of safety zone. You know, the idea with bike fit is it's almost like taking your fingernail and scratching your skin. 
If you were to do that, it just feels like a scratch. But if you do that 10,000 times, you will break through the skin and it will bleed. Yeah. But if you move your finger back two millimeters, now you're not scratching it. You could do that all day long and you won't cause that damage. That's how bike fit is, is we see folks that are doing like Paris Breast Paris or riding 1,200 kilometers in 80 hours. Think about the number of repetitions and back to back, the amount of load that we have to have them control. So many repetitions, you have to be so precise. Otherwise, you know, you're just asking for an overuse injury. Yeah, yeah. And I guess one of the advantages of having, having somebody come into your shop is that you get to see them and you can see if the knee is sticking out or something sure. funny in the movement that they wouldn't feel it in 10 minutes of riding their bike. But after five mm -hmm. hours, that probably eventually going to show up somewhere. Yeah. And some people only ride four hours. They never ride more than four hours. All of a sudden they go to five hours to six hours. All of a sudden, boom, everything is off, is off the rails because they've been right. operating underneath this threshold for so long. All of a sudden they went over the threshold. Now, oh, now I'm in trouble. Yeah. Well, and it's true for, I think all athletic endeavors is that, you know, if you're going to increase your, your work output, you got to do it gradually, uh, give your body a chance to adapt to it. I have made this mistake <laughs> terribly many times. You know, it's like uh, riding four hours on the weekends and it's like, I'm going to do 10 hours this weekend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't work out. Yeah. Okay, good. We're, I think we're going to get this thing under the wire here. I wonder if, especially as a PT, are there some like general things? I mean, if a person really just loves their bike and they want to have a good functioning body for riding a bicycle, are there like general, you know, stretches or exercises that you recommend that people do just regularly, you know, every other day or every day when they wake up or things like that? Yeah, great question. I mean, the more, I guess the, the, the greatest way or the best global way to answer that question is just the more time you're spending on the bike, the more activities you need to do to reverse that position. So what I mean by that is if I'm hunched over the bike, uh, I just rode a ride the other day and I rode 15 hours or 17 hours total wow. time, 15 hours ride time, 17 hours total time. Again, the more time that you're hunched over that bike, you have to balance out with reversing that motion. So that would be backwards bending things or bringing your hands behind your back or everything that you're in that position, just do the opposite of it. You know, oh, that's, that's kind of the generalized idea. We have to balance things out. It's like sitting. We just sit all day long. We're just rounding forward. We have to stand up. We have to backwards bend. We have to reverse that position to balance. Nice. You know, if I take my finger and I just pull it backwards and hold it like that, that's just a stretch. But if I hold that for like two hours, I'm going to cause an injury. Uh -huh. But if I take pressure off that and let it relax and kind of move the opposite way, I can go back to stretch that finger again and it's okay. Uh -huh. Our body's the same way. If we're in one prolonged position for a very long time, we have to kind of balance things out by going the other direction. Otherwise, we're just going to develop injuries. <laughs> uh -huh. I wonder if you would advise people when they're riding their bike to get out of the saddle sometimes and you know, change the position. Well, especially for saddle relief, you need to be able to be standing up on the saddle. You can't just stay seated and grind the whole time. You have to do what we call pressure relief. You have to do pressure relief or stand up on the pedal, straighten your knees all the way out. Typically when we're pedaling, our knees don't go all the way straight. So right. stand up, you know, stand up on the pedal, straighten your knees out, drop your heel, stretch your calf. Um, you know, if you come to a stoplight, you know, try to get some twisting in there, rotate that spine, you know, look over your shoulder, uh, you know, bring your hands behind your back, lift your chest, stretch your chest out, all that stuff to open all those things up. Um, and that a lot of times will, especially when you get into ultra endurance cycling, you have to have things to kind of balance things out because you can't just be crunched over there for hours and hours and hours and expect to not be pain, pain in severe pain, you know. Or start to become permanently, you know, hunched over, yeah. shoulders forward, neck out, um, that sort of a thing. I mean, you see yeah. people like that. And, and it, you know, the sitting and riding a bike have a lot of similarities. And so if, if that's yeah. all you do is sit at your desk and sit in your car and sit on your bike, you're going to look like a person who's sitting, even when you're standing. <laughs> so, I mean, do you like planks? Are planks good? Are mobility drills, that sort of thing? Great question. Yeah. Like when we get into core strength, I, I think like planks are great, but really what we're starting to realize is that plank, if we think about plank, we're really working abs and we're really not moving. We're really not resist, resist, resisting much force. Uh -huh. The whole point of core is to be able to stabilize our spine, stabilize our skeletal system while we're taking forces from a variety of different angles. So a plank is fine, but we don't just hang on the bike. I think people assume because we're flexed forward, 
we need to have strong abs when actually the strongest muscles you need on your body for cycling is actually your lower back muscles. Mm. It's more than abs. Because as you push into those pedals, if you imagine climbing a really big hill and you're pushing as hard as you can through those pedals, your back will start to round or the bike will start to grow out from underneath you. And you have to have those back muscles be strong to lock you down, to hold you there, mm. therefore be able to create force to the pedal. So a lot of times I think people, because we're in this hunched over position, they assume it's all about abs when it's yeah. really actually more about back extensors. So that would be more like bridges and you know, bird dog exercises and things of that. And you're strengthening the back muscles. Superman. You got it. All that kind of stuff is super, is probably, I would say more valuable than core. I also do a lot of swinging of kettlebells and you can just do one arm swings, two arm swing side to side, r go around your back with a kettlebell, all these different forces. This is what we're really trying to fight with core is actually forces from a variety of directions, not just hanging out on our elbows on a plane. I see. So like a, a one-sided carry kind of a thing where you're yeah, so I, I almost call it like a suitcase carry so imagine you're running through the airport with your suitcase you just take that kettlebell with one arm swinging it as hard as you can but while keeping your core tight so now you're yeah. actually resisting and the most the biggest stresses that we get as cyclists is rotational forces yeah. one leg one leg one leg one leg we're pedaling it's rotation rotation through our spine that we have to control right, so why are right. we not doing more things to resist rotational things yeah that makes sense yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of, you want to just make, make the core training fit the sport. And like I said, plank is fine. But it just, I just, I think I've kind of almost thrown those out lately because it's just not as effective as resisting forces. It's not functional. Yeah. It's just, and you probably will get more bang out of your buck swinging a kettlebell than you will doing planks. And who likes doing planks anyway? I love them. <laughs> oh, you do. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm weird. Yeah, that's it. Maybe one person. Does. I don't know. <laughs> Last question on this particular topic, and that's that classic cyclist is you've got tight hip flexors and your glutes don't engage. What do you advise for people to deal with this? Well, we have to, I think when we talk about the ability to fire glutes or what we call the whole posterior chain, which is hamstrings and glutes and all of that, we have to make sure that they squat correctly. Uh -huh. And what I mean by that is there's something that we teach clients, and I know this doesn't come across on radio very well, but we teach people what we call the hip hinge. If you were to imagine like a deadlifter or someone lifting a weight, you have to kind of sit your butt back and kind of come backwards. And the more that you sit backwards and keep your back flat, the more you're going to engage more of hamstrings, more butt. Huh. A lot of folks, when we see people and how they squat, if people squat by raising on their toes and their knees go past their toes drastically, typically they're only using their quadriceps. They're only using their thighs to push up. We want to balance out all of that system. We want to be able to do, yes, of course, quads, but we have to balance out hamstrings and butt as well. And the way to teach that with folks a lot of times is with squat, making sure people can do a correct squat correctly. Uh -huh. Number two, also lunges. Thing, these kind of things where we're kind of pushing the key is really is coaching people on pushing through their heel when they're doing a squat. Uh, Not that I'm saying you're going to do that on the bike of pushing with your heel, but if we teach people that way, that will start to recruit more glutes versus uh, positioning. Also, if the cleat is too far toward the toes, yeah. again, you're going to try to use your calf as a power generator and your quads. You're neglecting completely the hamstring and the butt when you're really far toward those toes like that, because it forces you to point those toes down and really be very stabby with our pedal stroke right. versus the ability to drop our heel and drag through at the bottom of that kind of pedal stroke in that small range. Okay, great. So that was the last of my questions. I'm going to turn it over to you and I would like you to tell us anything that I was not smart enough to think to ask, but also <laughs> how to find you online for, you know, right. maybe, maybe yeah. somebody on here is a, is a PT and wants to learn how to do bike fits or, you know, maybe somebody Perfect. lives in the Portland area and would like to Love come it. see you. Love it. I think my, I think my final, my final take home that I just really want people to understand is that in bike fitting, this is going to be kind of the name of the game is there is a lot of ego and there's a lot of seriousness that surrounds bike fit. There are people that are very intense. There are very much people that want to tell everyone that you're wrong, that you're doing it wrong, and my way is right. And look at me. I treat all the pros, so I am the smartest and I am the greatest bike fitter. Do not believe any of that. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Number one, just like Peter Sagan, we'll go back to Peter Sagan. Why so serious? Bicycling should always default to fun. 
And if you have people that make things so serious and are so aggro and do not make you feel comfortable and supported and heard, that is not the bike fitter for you. Uh-huh. Bike fit does not need to be serious. It does not need to be so like, it's my way or the highway. Look at me, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of that out there. And the more that you start to get into the bike fit circles, you'll realize there are characters in this industry that are really toxic. Uh, that are not great people. And the funny thing about those guys is, A, they don't even ride bikes. And number two, they teach a lot and like to tell everyone what's wrong. And they also sell a lot of gear. So <laughs> that's, my, that's, I just, that's my blanket statement for that. Now, if you want to get a hold of me or find out more about me, we have a great website called pedalpt.com. Uh, I can be found generally on Instagram uh, at pedalpt. Our company site is at pedal underscore PT. And then we also do have at pedal PT online Academy, or I think it's just pedal PT Academy um, as well. So that would be the easiest ways to get a hold of me. Um, like I said, we do have a YouTube channel as well. And that's just listed under my name as Kevin Schmidt, uh, pedal PT. Um, and we've got, I think I've got about 45 videos of just going through injury scenarios. Uh, if you have knee pain, this is what you want to do remedies to situations. So, a lot of your audience might find that interesting, especially if they have specific pains like IT band pain, hip pain, back pain, neck pain. I kind of break it down in symptoms that we have and I break it into as a question answer. I get asked, you know, probably hundreds of questions a week from people all over the country asking me questions about things. I just take those questions and then I just film a short video of me here at the office where I just answer those questions for everybody. So as I always say, it's your questions that keep this channel going. So the more questions I get, the more we can help other people. And also there's no silly questions. We all had to start somewhere. We were all beginners at one time. So this cycling world of intimidation and uh, non-openness and kind of discouraging people, um, it's just not okay for me. Cycling should always be fun. And like I said, I even do bike fits on tall bikes and Franken bikes and fat bikes and <laughs> e-bikes and all the bikes, um, like I said, and with no judgment. We want to make sure everybody, my life's mission is basically to get more people enjoying cycling, whatever that means to them, without pain. That's it. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. That's great. I'm going to get those links into the show notes for anybody Thanks, who Good didn't stuff. take notes on that. Kevin, thank you very much. You're not only an expert, you're a genuinely nice fellow. And, Thanks, you know, man. if I, um, even though I don't need a bike fit, if I lived in Portland, I'd come see you anyway. If you're ever in town, please stop by. Yeah, I'd come there. It's just, yeah. just for fun and hanging out with you, man. <laughs> Good stuff. A lot of fun. Thank you, guys. Thank you, both of you guys. And have a great night. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening in to our chat with Kevin Schmidt of Pedal PT. You can find more information about Kevin in the show notes.